Coming up on DTNS, Windows 11 is coming. Should you be excited? Selling NFTs with feature journalism and a programming language that puts accessibility first. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, June 24th, Windows Day 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm from Studio Redwood. I'm Sarah Lane. Austin Deck, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. We were just talking about company culture and how you get the kitchen you deserve on Good Day Internet. Uh, if you want to know what that means, become a member. Patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Google delayed its plan to block third-party cookies in Chrome until late 2023, saying that the delay will give sufficient time for public discussion on the right solutions and for publishers and the advertising industry to migrate their services. The company had originally announced it would phase out third-party cookies by 2022 as part of its Privacy Sandbox initiative. Indian telco Geo and Google announced the Geophone Next what they call an ultra-affordable Android smartphone. It's aimed at getting 300 million users in India that still use 2G networks to upgrade, start using 4G. The phone will launch on September 10th, run a highly optimized version of Android, and of course include an LTE modem. Although price and exact hardware specs were not announced, it's expected to come in well under $100 US. TCL showed off a wearable display called Nextwear G a few months ago at this year's CES and now plans to release it in July. Initially in Australia for 899 Australian dollars, it's about 680 US, and eventually coming to other markets as well. It's not an AR headset, it's not a VR headset, rather it includes two 1080p micro OLED panels to provide the effect of viewing a 140-inch screen. Hmm. So just an R? Heads up. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, Snap reached a deal with Universal Music Group, which will let Snapchat users use Universal's tracks in messages and posts, as well as share links to full songs from streaming services. Snap first launched this feature in October with Warner Music and previously had access to song rights from Universal and Sony, but not the music performed by Universal artists. Back in 2018, President Trump signed the FOSTA-SESTA Act, which set financial penalties for hosting illegal sex work-related content. It's an exemption to Section 230, which otherwise does not hold platforms liable for content posted by their users. The U.S. Government Accountability Office issued a report on how often the law was invoked since its passage three years ago. It was invoked once on June 2020 in a criminal case that's still in court, and once in a civil case that was dismissed with no damages awarded. It did have the effect for causing many commercial sex platforms to move overseas or shift to conventional social media, making prosecution more difficult. All right, folks, let's talk about it. Microsoft introduced Windows 11, and uh, they packed in some surprises, even though we had a, a leak of it ahead of time. The Microsoft Store will accept pretty much any kind of app a developer makes, a good old-fashioned Win32, universal Windows platform, of course, or even a progressive web app. And any developer can bring its own commerce engine, keeping 100% of its revenue. Microsoft won't make you use its payment platform. If you bring your own, Microsoft gets nothing. Adobe Creative Cloud was showed off as an example. Also, the Amazon App Store, yes, you heard me right, the Amazon App Store will be available in the Microsoft Store, meaning you'll be able to get Android apps and run them in Windows, thanks to Intel Bridge, a runtime post compiler. This looks like it'll work like it does in Chrome OS. And Windows updates will be 40% smaller and can happen in the background, so you don't have to reboot. On the interface side, the start menu moves to the center, loses live tiles, sorry folks, and has an integrated search bar. You can now snap two to six apps into something they're calling a snap layout that adapts to the screen size even when you unplug your laptop. So let's say you have five things tiled in various sizes. You unplug, you go from your big display to your laptop, it'll still be there, it'll just adjust all the sizes of the tiles. You can save these layouts in snap groups and pin them to the taskbar for quicker access. So you can have multiple groups of different kinds of apps, kind of like virtual desktops, but different since Windows actually does have virtual desktops as a separate thing. If you detach your keyboard in a, in a convertible, uh, Windows 11's tablet mode uh, is gone. Uh, it, it will not be changing the layout. It'll just note that the keyboard's gone and make touch targets like icons bigger. 
And if you turn it vertical, side-by-side -side apps will just switch to a vertical stack. The on-screen keyboard will still show up. Uh, it'll add swipe typing, emojis, and voice commands. Uh, and haptic feedback will be available for your stylus. A widgets screen will be able to slide in from the left. That'll include a personalized feed of things like news, weather, calendar, to-do list, recent photos, uh, and even have a built-in ability to tip creators. I'd be interested to hear more about that. Oh, and Teams is now integrated into Windows instead of Skype. A Teams icon will show up on the taskbar, pop up your chat list, all of that. So Skype, uh, not going to do that anymore. Teams is the new future. The Xbox Games app supports Xbox's auto HDR for automatically showing a game in HDR and the Direct Storage API that can load a game faster by sending it straight from an NVMe drive to the GPU. And of course, Xbox Game Pass. You probably expected that. Uh, it's in this Xbox app and includes cloud gaming. Windows 11 ready PCs are available right now. So you don't have to wait if you're buying a PC you can get one that will work with Windows 11, but you can't get Windows 11 itself yet. A Windows 11 test build is going to roll out early next week. With any new OS, of course, there are new minimum requirements. To run Windows 11, your machine's going to need at least the following. 4 gigs of RAM, 64-bit processor uh, with at least two cores running a gigahertz, 64 gigs of storage, a 720p display, a direct... X12 compatible GPU and a TPM 2.0 module. We didn't get a date for a consumer release, just to promise that it'll arrive by the holiday season. So probably November should be my guess. When it does arrive, Windows 11 will be free to existing Windows 10 users, arriving through Windows Update, just like any update to Windows 10 did. However, if you're going to do a fresh install of Windows 11 Home, you'll have to have an internet connection and a Microsoft account to set it up. Uh, Pro and Enterprise versions won't need that, but Microsoft Windows 11 Home will. So there I gotta you go, say, folks. Windows 11. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't use. I. I haven't been using Windows 10 on on any daily basis uh, for some time. Uh, my the, my single Windows 10 system can be upgraded to Windows 11, so I'll do that just for fun. I gotta say, Snap Layouts, uh, just because this particular laptop I'm talking about, I did used to use it with this monitor uh, that I'm using with another machine now, and the layout was always an issue <laughs> going from one to another. So little thing, but that's nice. Uh, the biggest thing that I'm uh, uh, intrigued by is the idea that Windows 11 is going all out with apps, uh, especially in, in in what I think kind of returning to an elemental uh, a DNA of what Windows is. That this is not necessarily, while it's going to look prettier, while it will indeed uh, uh, you know continue the the design progression that I think has made the interface a lot more pleasing to the eye. I love the idea that it is a total free for all when it comes to apps and, and Android, the Amazon store, build your own e-commerce engine, whatever you want, you're allowed to do it here. It draws a stark line in the sand uh, with, with uh, the Mac ecosystem. And, and I think it's cool. I'm glad that it exists. Yeah, what, what's not traditionally Microsoft about this announcement is that instead of introducing 17 versions of Windows, yes. they're simplifying things. They, yeah. are, they haven't simplified everything. There's still a little Windows complexity under the hood. You can still find some of the old interface elements under there. We'll see how it works in practice. But instead of Windows 10X, they put Windows 10X into Windows 11. And now Windows 11 will be adaptable. And so you don't have to have the burden of which Windows do I need Theoretically, it's just going to run on whatever you install it on. Now, I'm very curious how that's going to work on ARM and AMD, especially with running Android apps with an Intel technology. There's a lot of questions to be answered there. What is traditionally Microsoft about this is how Satya Nadella and Panos Panay really pushed personal agency. You are in control, not us. We're not telling you what to do. We're making a beautiful, simple operating system, but we're not going to stop you from doing something. You want to put that start menu back on the left? Go for it. Personal agency, they hammered over and over. Uh, and they, they talked a lot about being for the creator. So they were positioning themselves against Apple. App, it's the, yeah. it's, it's the old-fashioned debate. I kind of love that. Um, it's back, baby. <laughs> Uh, we also must say goodbye to a few things. Windows 11 Cortana, no longer part of the boot experience. Skype, OneNote, Paint 3D, and 3D Viewer, no longer part of clean installs. You can still get them in the Microsoft Store, though. And the ribbon interface is going away from File Explorer. You're not getting tabs, but 
you're losing the ribbon interface in favor of a more touch-friendly control system built into the top section. Well, artist Mike Winkleman, you might know him better as Beeple, became one of the faces of the rise of NFTs, selling his every day is the first 5,000 days with an NFT that sold for a cool $69.3 million. Now he's co-founding an NFT platform called We Knew, spelled like Renew, but with a W, designed to sell limited edition NFTs representing iconic moments in the careers of athletes and also artists. Pitchfork founder Ryan Schreiber serves as the editor-of-chief of We Knew to curate the moments sold on the platform and then build stories around them. The idea is that an each NFT sale will be a series of items that tell a story accompanied by feature-length stories of why these events mattered. The first series of NFTs will commemorate Andy Murray's journey to winning Wimbledon back in 2013, ranging in price from $49 to $4,999 each. Some of the more expensive NFTs come with physical items. You see that sometimes these days, like signed posters, trophy replicas. The buyer of Murray's game-winning point gets 30 minutes of tennis time with Murray himself. So that's a pretty cool IRL perk if you're a Murray fan. We News first sale begins on July 2nd. I, I think this is smart. Uh, I have long said that NFTs are not quite the gold rush that people thought they were a few months ago, but rather just a proof of concept on whether or not people were ready to buy digital collectibles. This is taking that idea and stretching it out a little bit further by making it more exciting and informative uh, uh, for, for the consumer before they buy digital collectibles. Uh, <laughs> I think the idea of partnering with the athletes themselves to to make a big event out of this is a good idea and now you're going to curate some long form journalism along with it but ultimately i think this is what we've always understood nfts to be a buying of a file and and that might be something that's foreign to some people but to others it's just another collectible that they can own yeah, I, 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 it's way too early to say what NFTs will become if they become anything. But what I take out of this is that the direction they're going in now is an NFT alone, not enough. Uh, packaging it with a physical item, interesting. Packaging it with an experience, because we know that millennials particularly love buying experiences. Okay, now you're talking about something. You get 30 minutes to play tennis with Andy Murray and you get to read this amazing story from the Schreiber-led editorial team. I think that's interesting. I'm, I'm not saying it'll work, but I think it's an interesting approach to it'll say, let's bring people in with feature journalism. This could be a way to pay for journalism and then sell them memories. It, it'll be worth it because people buy experiences now for charity, right? The fact that it'll come with an NFT will be its own thing. If anything, that's like the least of their worries. You're always going to be able to you know, have somebody spend a lot of money to play tennis with Andy Murray for 30 minutes. Uh, it, it's them moving the $49 stuff. I and mean, I think what they hope is that you do this great feature story and somebody gets the end to, uh, of it and they're really excited. And then it's like, would you like 50? Would you like an NFT for 50 bucks? That's Man, that's interesting. That way. moment in 2012 when he, when he, when he said, you know, he apologized for losing. I, I could own that. I could own that moment. Yeah. Yeah. That's oh, what they're going to try to sell. Forever. Alphabet's Deep Mind announced a new partnership with the Geneva-based Drugs for the uh, Drugs for Neglected Dine uh, Diseases Initiative, and it uses AlphaFold AI to discover new treatments for Chungus disease. And oh, geez, uh, 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 Leishmaniasis. Uh, both deadly diseases that impact millions of people. AlphaFold was used on January 2020 to map out a number of the SARS-CoV-2 virus proteins that were later confirmed to be accurate. And in November 2020, it topped the protein predicting challenge called CASP, or Critical Assessment of Protein, of, uh, protein Structure Prediction. So it is unprecedented, uh, unprecedented at figuring out how proteins fold. For Chongus disease, researchers already had identified a molecule that can bind to a protein on the parasite that causes Chongus disease and kill it. But they used AlphaFold to generate a prediction of the protein's structure, something that would have taken years otherwise. That prediction will hopefully let them design drugs that can bind to the protein in different ways, making sure they kill all of the parasites in a patient's uh, bloodstream, which is required to cure the disease. A similar approach will be taken to other diseases in the coming years. AlphaFold hopes to expand structure prediction, making it faster and more accurate. 
if it proves to work, it can help doctors who lack resources to study infections work on new treatments, no matter, uh, no matter where in the world they are. Although some researchers caution that algorithms are never perfect and there will still be some instances where it doesn't work. Yeah, so the accessibility is an interesting part of this. Uh, if if this works, you just need the computing power and a connection, which is much easier to get than a fully equipped lab that you can spend years uh, investigating. Uh, so the the accessibility, uh, I, I think, is in incredibly important here. Obviously, it's early days, and and it's it's important to caution, like, hey, it may not work that often. We we've only tried it a couple of times, so one or two hits doesn't doesn't mean that we'll keep getting more, but obviously worth uh, pursuing. It's it's helped with COVID. Uh, it seems to have helped with Chagas disease. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what else it might be able to help with. Also, I mean, just just taking into account that there there is an initiative called Drugs for Neglected Diseases, meaning, OK, this is a disease that affects a lot of people, often, fa you know, is a fatal disease. Uh, it's extremely complex. There's folding of proteins that is just, it's just a huge amount of resource and time suck, for, even for people who you know, dedicate their careers to this. Anything that, that, that helps the process along is a great idea. It's a great use of AI. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point because, uh, it's, it, it's a, a neglected disease because we only have so much resource, right? And if you can yeah. make it less resource intensive to investigate, then you can devote more resources to it because you don't have to devote as many. And it also takes out a layer of specialization. You know, uh, I've said it here before that, you know, AI is a very, very, very good guessing machine. Like that's a better way to think of AI than to think of it as some kind of magical oracle or a way that technology can create reality, right? It is good at guessing. And so it will never be perfect. But also when you think about it, so is research. You know, the best researchers in the world are taking their best, most educated guesses and trying to prove whether or not it is real or not. It is all trial and error at the end of the day. And this can take a, a, a huge element of specialization and just give you some good guesses. And, and, you know, whether or not this is going to be better or worse, I think is the wrong way to think about it. The best way to think about it is it's a replacement on, on, on some level that you can just move forward in areas that probably wouldn't have the same kind of ability. And it replaces tedium. The guessing yeah. we're talking about is we think the protein folds like this. Uh, let's see if if we assume that it does, whether stuff we do works. Uh, that takes years to figure out like, okay, we're pretty sure it folds like this. This takes the tedium out of that, where it's not, it's not like being smart in guessing. It's like working through a bunch of possibilities. And that's that's what machine learning can can short circuit really well in this particular case. Hey, folks, if you're listening to this and you're like, gosh, I bet Jury had the best face just now when he was reading that. Uh, well, you could see that in our video podcast. If you want DTNS as a video podcast, get the video RSS feed at dailytechnewsshow.com slash subscribe. Often we talk about accessibility, and a lot of times we discuss the way applications work for people who are maybe vision impaired, deaf, limited dexterity. But what about the tools that create those applications, like programming languages? Andrea Stefik has developed Quorum, a programming language that takes blind users into account. At least it started that way. He's a PhD and associate professor of computer science at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Andreas, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Tom. Well, thanks for having me. How did Quorum get its start? So uh, Quorum started out when I was uh, in graduate school. I was scouring for a PhD project, and I was reading a number of mailing lists of problems people had. And I came across these mailing lists of blind computer programmers, and the problems that they were discussing were really fascinating. So uh, as you can imagine, like how do you uh, get access to someone tactily through Braille, or how do you listen to something through audio to try to represent? And the interesting, the thing I found really compelling about it was is that if you have a disability, and you want to invent some kind of technology to make your life better, well, how to use the programming environments is exactly what you would need to use. So if those aren't accessible, it's like a chicken and egg problem. So we started by looking at that, and then we got some support from the National Science Foundation to start working with schools for the blind and visually impaired. And we just sat around basically talking to children and watching them and seeing what problems they had and, and trying to get a better uh, sense of the situation. That's where it sort of started, I guess you'd say. What did you reevaluate in developing a programming language for vision impaired programmers? 
Yeah, that's a good question. So what, there's a couple of things that we noticed sort of pretty quickly. One of them was when we had children use them, you see all sorts of neat things because kids, unlike professional programmers where they, you know, they've been using the technology for a long time, they're used to it. They might even, you might even say they're biased toward whatever they're used to. A little to. set in their ways. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's actually some strong evidence of this. You can actually calculate. There's an equation. I swear this is true. There's an equation to calculate how much bias someone has gotten toward their programming environments. Anyway, it's, it's not important, but for blind children, we basically sat, we'd watch them and they'd, we'd, we'd let them use their screen reading, their sort of talking devices as they programmed. And we basically like, hey, how hard was that? Or did you understand what that meant? And when, when we did that, we observed that a lot of the things that we take for granted in programming were actually really hard for kids. So for example, if you want to tell the computer to do something over and over again, that's traditionally a loop. And in computer programming, you would often use a phrase visually and it would say something, it would look like, four left paren, int i equals zero semicolon, i less than 10 semicolon, i plus plus right paren left brace, which is not easy to understand in audio. If you're talking, if you're use making a tool for people that are blind, you want the most important content first, and that must be short, right? So like, if you have an error, it might say name missing as the very first thing, and then it will give you some other information on top of that, that sort of idea. So when you say it's evidence based, uh, I, I think we kind of get a get a sense of what that means. But explain that a little more. What what do you look for? How do you how do you change a programming language based on evidence? Oh, that's a really good question. So other communities outside of computer science have really strict standards about what they mean for evidence. So what, the one that I'm probably the most familiar with is the medical community. So here's an example: if you want to sell a drug you have to go through a series of phases of evidence gathering, and those are imperfect, they're flawed, they have their issues and stuff like that. But the idea is you first test with animals, doesn't apply directly to programming, but you'll get the idea. And then you sort of scale those up, testing certain other things along the way. And we do the same thing with programming languages. For example, uh, in Quorum, if you have a loop, this is one of the simplest things we've gathered evidence on years ago, Instead of saying four left paren, blah, 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 we say repeat 10 times. And why is that? Because we've done surveys on the word choices. We've done formal randomized controlled trials on comparing them each together. You know, like one group gets this, the other group gets that, and we see who wins. And we do that across hundreds and hundreds of studies and other academics do it too. And we see if we get the same answer. I, I feel like even if someone's very excited about this, uh, even if they understand the 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 ability to make it more accessible, uh, makes it more widely applicable, there's probably people wondering like, yeah, but I can't get a job programming in Quorum, can I? Uh, how does Quorum fit into the practical level of like, I need to get out there and, and do some work? Yeah, that's true. I think that like today, one of the downsides of focusing on the evidence base and the K through 12 space first is that you aren't gonna be able to get jobs in Quorum right now because we haven't even tried to like mm -hmm. push it up to professional practice. But there's two questions that I think are interesting. One is, which language do you use when you wanna to get to professional practice? It turns out universities don't really have standards, mm -hmm. right? And we also know that these, these languages change. Like 20 years ago, people weren't programming in Python, and that's the truth. But today, that's very common. So we actually just, um, just got funded by the National Science Foundation like a month or so ago, our first attempt to try to push up to communities so we started gathering evidence across different professional groups. We found one that was the most amenable to change was actually data scientists. And it makes sense, right? Because they have to learn, yeah. like, not only is it for left friend type junk, that, but they name everything after the mathematician's name or by single letter names. And they don't like that, right? Like T-test, F-test, a pairwise T-test with a Bonferroni correction. Those words won't even mean anything to people unless they're already deeply embedded in the community. So what we thought to do was, to run a lot of the same types of studies to make data science easier. And that is for professional practice as our first attempt. We have about four years to solve that problem. So we'll see if we start to make inroads on the professional practice over the next couple of years. If people want to learn more about Quorum, get involved, where should they go? Uh, we have a website, quorumlanguage.com. And you're welcome to tweet at me at, at Andreas Stepik if that's, your, if that's your wish. So, Andreas, thank you so much for, for chatting with us. This was fascinating. No problem, Tom. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the invitation. We also want to give special thanks to listener Daniel Hartwig for putting us in touch with Andreas. And if you want to catch the full 18-minute interview, and I think you probably do, we'll be posting it up this weekend for our patrons.
All right, so Rembrandt von Rhein, uh, pretty famous artist, you may have heard of Rembrandt, uh, also has a very famous painting called The Night Watch. It was originally completed in 1642, and then it was trimmed down in the early 1700s. Yeah, the sides were just trimmed off because it was supposed to fit on a new wall where it was being hung, and the wall couldn't fit the original painting. Now, although the trimmed portion hasn't ever been found, the Associated Press reports that researchers have been able to reconstruct the missing pieces. Very interesting how they did it. Using a smaller copy of the original that was painted at the time by Garrett Lundens, then they created scans. They used scans, x-rays, and 528 digital exposures taken of Rembrandt's original painting to train an AI model to imitate Rembrandt's style and fill in the blanks based on Lundens' copy. So, yeah, you want how the original artist would have painted the missing pieces, but we kind of know what the missing pieces look like because we already had a copy. The work was conducted as part of the Operation Night Watch project. It is being exhibited at the Honor Gallery in Amsterdam's Rijksmuseum. There are two new faces that you, you can now see present on the left side. A small child was previously running on a frame, now seen leaning on a railing. The whole human is. So uh, if you're a fan of of this kind of artwork, it is a pretty cool project. Yeah, uh, I learned today that uh, uh, back in the 1600s, a Rembrandt uh, was not as respected as it is today. And you just slice it up if you had a small frame. That's crazy. I yeah. mean, it's a look. You got to fit it on the wall, man. It brings the whole. Yeah, right. That's yeah, incredible. It's good, it's good stuff. Uh, yeah, check it out, folks. Uh, I, and uh, The Verge has a link to the uh, the version that exists where you can like zoom in and see that the kid who looks like they're running out of frame, and then you can compare it to a smaller version of, of, of the restored version where you see like, oh, right, they weren't running at all. It's, it's pretty good. Let's check out the mailbag. So we had a conversation yesterday uh, with our guests about how we all back up our photos. You know, Google Photos is not going to let you do unlimited anymore. So we just sort of went around the horn and talked about how we all do it. Chris says he uses Google Drive to store photos. After the photos are uploaded to Google Drive, Chris says he can organize them into folders, rename them, have folders within folders, download those folders to his MacBook and copy them to a USB for offsite storage. Or Chris says, give to my daughter or another relative. Also, once the folder is established on Google Drive, you can directly upload new pictures of the same ilk to that folder. The upload process can be both push and pull. Chris says, in many cases, I've shared folders on Google Drive with family and friends, and they can see our events, Easter, Christmas, etc. And in some cases, share technical pieces with other folks who share the same interest. Oh, that's so, it's so cool. I like I like uh, that we're getting these. Dan uh, Daniel also sent us uh, what what Daniel does uh, for organizing photos. I I, lo I love getting these different perspectives on this. Chris's is kind of like half DIY, but also taking advantage of cloud. It's really cool. Totally. I also realize how many photos I clearly do not share with family and friends. These are all really good solutions. And everybody on the show except me yesterday was like, yeah, you know, albums to share with family and friends. So, yeah, this is a great one. A lot of people use Google Drive. Maybe you could use it for photos if you're not already doing so. If you have uh, some photo tips, life hacks, tricks, all the all the things, send those to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Anything really that's on your mind, questions, comments about the show, we'll take it. Thank you in advance. Also, shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. Today, they include High Tech Oki, Martin James, and David Mosher. And guess what, everybody? We have a brand new boss, and his name is Roy Riemann. Just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you a million, Roy. Roy, You're Roy, than Roy, an Roy, NFT. Roy, 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 Roy. Yeah, I'm just saying, if you become a brand new boss of, of DTNS, uh, we, we celebrate. So We're thank gonna you. We're going to keep shine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We're gonna have pie. We're gonna have cake. It's gonna be the best day ever. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Roy, I'm going to Casa Vega. Also, want to give a big thanks to Andreas Stefanik, uh, who you heard earlier in the show, and also Justin Robert Young for being with us today. Justin, you're a busy man. How do we keep up with you? Oh boy. Well, of course, on PX3, I just came back from New York covering their primaries. Big, interesting race there. You can hear my my little documentary of the final day of the trail. But really, the big noise is all about world's greatest con thank you to all the dtns listeners that downloaded it last week when uh, it it first debuted we became the number three podcast in all of the history category of, of of apple podcast that is gigantic and huge you guys are amazing and now episode three is out and live uh, if, if you've ever wanted to know 
how you get a corpse from London to the shores of Spain while making it seem like a fallen war hero. Every grimy, dirty detail is explained in this episode called In the Flesh of World's Greatest Comedy. That is quite a teaser. We're live Monday through Friday on this show. Here's your teaser, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 20.30 UTC. Be there, be square. Find out more at dailytechnewshow.com slash live. We are back tomorrow with Christoph Zajek Denik and his personal experience with accessibility. Also, find some stuff. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>